want to thank everyone um, who's involved in making this conference such a wonderful event, um, especially Wyatt. Wyatt's done a, a lot of important things for my family and me, um, one of which was to drive my California daughter, Lena, around this campus four years ago when she was thinking about coming to school here, which she um, eventually did. And it was great to, to hear her telling a friend when we got back to California about the experience of riding around the campus with Wyatt Pratty. And I overheard her saying, um, she said, you know, Dr. Pratty was driving us around campus and we're going past this house and he points out the window at the house and says, that house is haunted. And my daddy said, oh, it's haunted? And Dr. Pratty said, yeah, it's haunted. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the South, California girl. <clears throat> and I also want to um, just say that I'm having a, a wonderful time with my workshop with Joe McCorkle. I knew it would be good, but it's really, I'm, I have not enjoyed talking about fiction this much ever, um, so thank you. This is a story called The Orange Line, and I think the, um, the main thing you need to know, the only thing you need to know, is that there's a woman in it from Eastern Europe, and when she speaks, she would not sound like me. <laughs> the Orange Line. She always put on makeup at the kitchen table, and she still used fabulin, sent regularly from Budapest by her mother. Her supplies would eventually run out since Colgate Palmolive had announced plans to close the factory in Dorog next year. When that happened, she would make do. She was not one of those Eastern Europeans who clung to relics of their pre-immigrant lives, sleeping as her one Hungarian acquaintance in Boston did on a communist era bed with a crevasse in the middle which allowed it to metamorphose into a sofa during the daytime. But she had continued to use fabulin because it agreed with her skin. She applied it sparingly. A dab of moisturizing cream on her cheeks and neck, a touch of lip gloss, a little mascara. When she finished, it was almost noon. For a while, she had struggled to maintain the schedule she adhered to when she had a family to look after, rising at 6.30 to prepare breakfast, bacon eggs and big fluffy southern biscuits for Mason, who always took the 742 from Melrose Highlands, French toast, rice pudding, or fresh pastries for Anushka, who could easily have walked to school but would never have made it on time unless her mother drove her. So, so more often than not, Camilla did. Now she could sleep as long as she wanted, and she was finding that she wanted to sleep a lot. When she stepped down to the porch, she saw a Mayflower van backed into the driveway of the house across the street, both of her neighbors' BMWs parked at the curb. Two men were carrying out the largest flat-screen TV she'd ever seen and right behind them came two more movers with an only slightly smaller version. Mason had once remarked that if he stood in just the right spot in his own living room, he could see a great close-up of Tom Brady from a distance of 200 feet. <laughs> at least one TV, sometimes two or three, was on over there at any hour of the day or night. No wonder they were getting divorced. She had originally planned to drive in to meet Mason's friend, but the weather forecast was terrible, and as this was a Friday, the traffic exiting the city in late afternoon was sure to be brutal. So she decided to park at Oak Grove and take the Orange Line to Back Bay. She didn't really want to go, but for the past few weeks, she hadn't been able to find anything she really wanted to do. Novels failed to hold her attention. She dozed during movies. Lately, even Tokai didn't taste right. At 20 to 1, after a pot of room service Starbucks, he turned his phone on and counted the missed calls. One from the main number at the commercial, probably his editor, two from Diane, one from his daughter, and one from the sports information director at Boston College. Four voicemails. In the first, left about three hours ago, Diane said, Nikki, something's wrong with the car. <laughs> 
I can't get it to start. In the second, about five minutes later, she said, never mind, I must have forgotten to put it in park before turning it off last <laughs> night. Love you. In the third, his daughter, a grad student at Vanderbilt, said, Daddy, Mama's pretty upset. She can't get the car started. <laughs> in the fourth and final, left while he was in the shower, the Boston College SID launched his sportscaster voice. Hello, Nick. Just wanted to make sure you got in okay, got your credentials and so on. Let me know if you need anything. Up until kickoff tomorrow, we're here to please. He tried Diane, but his call went straight to voicemail, so he got dressed, stuck the phone in his pocket, and headed for the elevators. He'd visited Boston only once before in 1979, and his companion on that trip had been Mason Carlisle. Back then, just out of Ole Miss, they were traveling up the East Coast to attend baseball games, determined to see as many as they could before their money ran out. They caught a twin bill in Baltimore, the O's and the A's. Saw Steve Carlton fan 15 Pirates at Veterans in Philadelphia, watched a three-game series at Shea between the Mets and the Braves, then got rained out two, success two successive nights at Fenway, before finally gazing on the wonder called the Green Monster on an evening when Dennis Eckersley's fastball seemed to gyrate each time it neared the plate. Later, in some hole-in-the-wall bar on Mass Ave, they drank 50-cent beers, and Mason said, I wouldn't mind living up here. And doing what? Making a mint so I could sit in one of those boxes behind home plate. Well, he'd made his mint, judging from the last time Nick saw him in the summer of 1990. He'd been driving a brand-new cherry red Jaguar, and by the time Nick and his wife and daughter arrived at the Moorhead City Beach House they planned to share for a week with Mason and his family, whom they'd never met before, his old friend had paid the entire rental himself rather than half of it as they'd agreed. When Nick tried to reimburse him, Mason raised his hand and said, Listen, bro, what you do is more fun. What I do is more lucrative. Let's just leave it at that. Since it was clear Mason could afford the rental, he mumbled thanks and spent the rest of the week trying to buy enough beer and wine to make up for it. After that vacation in North Carolina, they talked less and less frequently, and when they discovered email, they quit talking altogether, though they always wrote to each other in advance of birthdays or on those rare occasions when the Ole Miss football team beat somebody it wasn't supposed to, like Alabama or LSU. Then one day, Nick and about 200 other people got a message from Mason saying he had terminal cancer, and 10 days later, he was dead. The death had shaken Nick in ways he still couldn't quite get a handle on, though it had happened more than three years ago. People with whom he was much closer had died. His next-door neighbor, his father and mother, a younger colleague at the commercial who considered Nick his mentor, but as much as those deaths bothered him, they hadn't rocked him like Mason's. He still couldn't figure out why. But having been dispatched to Boston to cover a Memphis BC football game, he was going to see his deceased friend's widow, whom he'd scarcely talked to all those years ago in North Carolina. She had seemed so focused on her husband and their daughter that you felt like you were annoying her by daring to say good morning. If you did speak to her, she would drop whatever she was doing and look at you with complete concentration, as though she intended to rebuff your attention by giving you more of hers than you were prepared for. <laughs> I'm wise to that trick, although I wouldn't mind it. <laughs> she was waiting in the lobby and that allowed her to observe him when he stepped off the elevator. Had she not gone through family photo albums and found the one for the summer they rented the beach house in North Carolina, she would not have recognized him because she had no memory whatsoever of his appearance. Many things that happened that particular summer were vague in her recollections, while others were so vivid they could still evoke misery. It was a period in her life when she did a number of things that were not characteristic leaving potatoes boiling until all the water evaporated and the pot began to smoke, losing her purse on the subway, running a red light two blocks from her house 
and causing a collision in which a little girl and the other motorist car suffered a fractured clavicle. At the time, she was in love with another man, a good friend of Mason's, who worked at the same brokerage house and was married to a woman she frequently saw at parties and had always liked. All summer, she remained distracted, hoping to find the courage, if that was the right word, to tell her husband she wanted to be with someone else. She carried a cordless phone into the basement almost every night so that after her family fell asleep, she could talk to her lover. Mason eventually spared her the need to confess, returning several hours early from a trip to Mississippi to see his ailing parents. He spotted the sporty Mercedes parked in the driveway and immediately understood what was happening. I'm going by the office he said in the message he left on the answering machine, which she could hear in the bedroom where she lay entangled with the man the car belonged to. Just give me a call when he's gone. It'd be nice if I didn't have to see him face to face for a couple more days, and it'd also be really great if you'd forego any lies. He paused, then added, I'm surprised I kept your attention as long as I did. She waited for him to suggest she'd only been after a green card, but he didn't, and later on she realized that he would never have said so even if he thought it. He loved her far too much to inflict such cheap pain. In the end, that love held them together, though she had never been able to return the amount due. She gave as much as she could. Now here she was meeting another of his friends, and he emerged from the elevator wearing blue jeans, a sweater, and a dark blazer. To her surprise, he also wore a pair of jogging shoes, gray ones, with an orange stripe on the sides. Unlike Mason, who'd lost most of his hair before he turned 40, Nick still had a full head of it, and it was still mostly blonde with only a few gray strands. Overall, he looked much more like a boy than a man, though he must have been 51 or 52 since he and Mason had graduated the same year. His gaze lit on her as she rose from one of those overstuffed sofas that seemed to clutter the lobbies of Marriott's all over the world. Nick, she said, extending her hand. Camilla? It was hard to miss the question mark, and equally hard to regard it as anything but evidence that she'd aged more than 20 years warranted. She didn't have the confidence she used to. She didn't have much confidence at all. Do I look that different? She asked. No, that's what surprised me. Instead of taking her hand, he put one arm around her and she rose onto her tiptoes and leaned into him. I forgot how tall you are, she said, without adding that she'd forgotten everything else about him too. <laughs> well, I'm not as tall as I used to be. Age and back pain have shaved a couple inches off me. He pointed at his shoes. That's why I wear these everywhere I go. They're cushioned to lessen impact. Mason had problems with his back. Football. I have some difficulties with my joints, but I'm afraid I can't blame them on anything other than being 50. He laughed and lightly touched her wrist. We might better head for the restaurant, hon, he said, sounding in that moment very much like her husband. Otherwise, we're liable to convince ourselves we belong in the ER. The place she'd chosen was on Newberry Street, and she told him it was where she and Mason had met. While they walked, she said she'd worked there on weekends for the former owner, who had no objections to illegally hiring a Hungarian exchange student since her English was good and he could pay her next to nothing. The night she served Mason's table, she said, he had been with yet another friend from the South, an older businessman who'd moved to Boston from Louisiana many years earlier. When she first approached to list the specials for the evening, Mason's dinner companion was telling him that he might consider taking elocution classes because a male with a southern accent sounded stupid to most Bostonians. <laughs> they love that twang when it's coming out of a woman's mouth, the older guy informed him. Why that is, I don't know. I'm not saying it's fair. <laughs> <laughs> what did Mace say? Nick asked, trying to envision his friend, three years out of Ole Miss, two-lane MBA in hand, learning the ropes from a more experienced man. He had the most stricken expression on his face. Later on, when I told him so, he said I'd mistaken the look that he was just struggling not to laugh. 
But I know perfectly well he was afraid he would never lose his accent, that he was destined to be a failure who'd have to slink back home to Mississippi. In fact, that accent served him well. They were crossing Copley Square, the Boston Public Library on the left, on the right, a Romanesque church that he remembered wandering into on his previous trip to the city. He'd paid attention to things like architecture back then. He'd envisioned a future for himself in which he would come to possess a vast amount of knowledge about famous buildings and great paintings, groundbreaking symphonies, and cutting-edge jazz. He foresaw three or four really important novels in that future, rather than a book of little magnitude every year or two. He smiled ruefully and shook his head. What, she said. I'm just thinking about who I was that time Mason and I came up here together. So who were you? A boy fresh out of the cotton patch? She stopped walking, so he did too. This time he said, what? She'd put on a pair of sunglasses when they left the Marriott. She tipped them up now as if to see him more clearly. The pause offered him the opportunity look, to look at her in bright sunlight. He'd lied to her back at the hotel. She had aged plenty. But she was, if anything, more striking now than she'd been 20 years ago. He'd heard her and Mason making love one night in North Carolina when he went outside to smoke a joint. He and Diane had made love themselves an hour or so earlier, taking care to be quiet because their second floor bedroom was right next to the one their daughter shared with the other little girl. Mason and Camilla were on the ground floor, and surely they meant to be quiet too, but as he stood at the edge of the beach, he heard her sobbing, so that at first he assumed something had happened to upset her. Then he realized the sobbing had a rhythmic quality and it carried more than a note of despair. He knew the line between joy and grief, pleasure and pain was thin, but he'd never heard such a sound coming from a human being before, and his first impulse was to take off down the beach to avoid the taint of indecency. Yet he continued to stand there listening, the joint clamped between his teeth, until finally the sound subsided, at which point he realized that the breeze off the ocean would carry the scent of weed right in their window. He dropped the joint, kicked sand over it, and slipped around to the rear of the house, waiting a good 15 minutes before going inside. The next morning at breakfast, Mason was his usual bumptious self. But Nick had the impression that Camilla somehow knew he'd heard her. He wasn't sure why he thought that, but he did, and it shamed and excited him. Now, as they stood studying each other in the middle of Copley Square, the sense of shame and excitement still lingered. He knew something about her that he had no right to know. When we were first together, she said, Mason liked to use that expression. What expression? Fresh out of the cotton patch. He often said that about himself. But he was from Pelahatchie. <laughs> yes, and I know the closest cotton field would have been about 100 miles away. He explained that to me. It was part of his persona, the young man from the provinces. He learned that in Boston it gave him a certain cachet. Nick said, Pelahatchie itself is not exactly Paris. <laughs> I know it isn't. I've been there. She settled her sunglasses on the bridge of her nose, and they continued on across the square, and while they walked, he enjoyed the feeling, new to him, of being engaged in mildly surreptitious activity though there really was nothing wrong with calling the widow of a deceased friend and asking if she'd like to have lunch. He couldn't think of a single reason why he shouldn't have told his wife he intended to do that, nor could he think of any good reason why he should have placed the call from work rather than from his home phone or his cell. He hadn't touched another woman for 30 years. He'd been as faithful as a basset hound. This place we're going, she said while they waited to cross Boylston, has a marvelous duck confit salad with Stilton cheese and arugula. The restaurant was below street level, beneath an art gallery and a brownstone. Directly in front of the bottom step, on what appeared to be a marble slab, stood a bronze horse with a candle between its front legs. Except for one elderly couple, the dining room was empty. The hostess led them to a booth. He chose the lobster salad sautéed with lemon and white beans. She had the duck confit. 
When asked, she expressed a preference for red wine over white, so they agreed to order an Oregon Pinot, and after it came, told the waiter they'd like to take their time. Nick raised his glass to the guy who's not here with us. Yes, she said, and they clicked. He took a sip. How's your daughter, he asked, and where is she? She had assumed both questions would be forthcoming, and she answered the second one first, since that was the easier of the two. She's in Port Elizabeth. Up in Maine? No, you're thinking of Cape Elizabeth. Port Elizabeth's actually in South Africa. Oh, what's she doing there? On the drive down the East Coast 20 years ago, Mason had offered her an assessment of his old friend from Mississippi. He's really bright. He used to read, I don't know, maybe four or five books a week. I mean, really dense stuff, penchant, or whatever that guy's name is that wrote Gravity's Rainbow. <laughs> but you could tell, even back then, exactly how he'd end up. He'd marry a girl from some little town in the Delta, and they'd settle into a comfortable life in Jackson or Memphis or Little Rock. Not New Orleans, not Atlanta, those are way too glitzy. <laughs> and he'd spend his time writing sports and occasionally reviewing a book he wished he'd written. What I'm saying is, Nick doesn't like to take chances. There are lines he just won't cross. She thought of that now because her daughter was nothing if not a taker of chances. And she thought of it too because about halfway across Copley Square, in the hazy way that one senses certain things, she had surmised that for Nick, inviting her to lunch constituted a risk. Why he'd decide to run it, she didn't know. But at this time in her life, it was hard not to feel flattered. How many afternoons could she spend at the MFA? How many times could she renovate her kitchen, especially since she liked a family to cook for? She still believed she had a lot to offer, but there was no one to offer it to. Well, she said, what Anna's doing in South Africa is something of a story. Stories are made to be told. So she told him how, during her junior year at Harvard, Anna had fallen in love with a graduate student from South Africa who was there to study philosophy. But in fact, she said, he spent most of his time hanging around jazz clubs like Scullers and Wallies and the Regatta Bar, picking up pointers from percussionists. He was a drummer, and he seems to have believed he experienced an epiphany while listening one night to Paul Motion. Do you know who that is? He smiled and turned his palms up, as if in supplication. I quit acquiring musical knowledge around 1980. I'm still grooving on the Allman Brothers. <laughs> well, apparently he's someone important. So this South African, whose name is Nigel, decided to discontinue his studies and return home to found a new jazz ensemble. And she followed, she followed. How's the ensemble doing? It lasted about six weeks. He broke up with her and the band at the same time. But she stayed, she stayed. The rest of it was harder to tell, but she did anyway, explaining that her relationship with her daughter had often been tumultuous. She didn't even know Anna had left the country until she'd been gone for almost a month. While she would occasionally respond to an email, she said, the best way to find out anything about her was through her own mother back in Budapest. Anna kept in regular contact with her. Right now, she was involved with a much older man who conducted bottom fishing charters out of Algoa Bay. She worked as a waitress at a beachfront cafe. Camilla watched him take it all in. At the beginning, he nodded sympathetically once or twice, but toward the end, he was just sitting there stone-faced. At least he didn't lower his gaze to avoid meeting hers. She waited for the obvious question. To her surprise, he neglected to pose it. Well, he said, that must be awful to deal with. I'm sure sorry to hear about it. He lifted his glass and took another sip of wine. She'd always thought she was quite capable of concealing her reactions, but evidently something showed on her face. Certainly, she felt a surge of heat in both cheeks. You could not accuse him of being unobservant. He was a journalist, after all. Did I say the wrong thing, he asked, just as the waiter arrived with their salads. The young man placed them on the table, refilled both of their glasses, then discreetly disappeared. She said, 
I feel as if I stripped half my clothes off in front of you and you elected not to notice in hopes I won't remove the rest. <laughs> Whereas the color had risen in her face, it drained very quickly from his. I'm so sorry, he said. He reached across the table and touched her hand. Please tell me what went wrong between you and your daughter. The elderly couple who had preceded them to the restaurant rose and the man helped the woman on with her coat. They stood there for a few moments, bantering with the waiter whom they must have known from previous visits. Camilla didn't speak again until they'd left. I was not exactly the perfect wife, she finally said. Mason forgave me on a number of occasions, but I think perhaps Anna suffered more. Who knows what her friends said to her about me, what they might have heard in their own homes. He didn't intend to be guilty of failing to ask the right questions again. What did you do that was so bad? I did what one usually does when he or she wants the world and has only a portion of it. I attempted to get more than I was entitled to. We're talking about affairs, I guess? She tried, but failed, to suppress a smile. Did I just say something funny? He asked. Forgive me. She laid her fork down and brushed a few strands of hair, red 20 years ago, but honey-colored now with the occasional lighter streak off her forehead. He noticed she still wore her wedding ring. It was right there on her finger when she reached across the table and touched his hand, just as he had touched hers. Don't you have anything to reveal? She asked. How could he say that he didn't? That would be about as bad as sitting down with his laptop tomorrow evening and reporting the score of the ball game he'd just witnessed without telling the reader anything else. The score was just part of it, and if the game was any good at all, it was probably the least interesting part. I've been married to the same woman for 30 years, he began. She's still pretty. She's smart, and people love her. She's been director of human resources for the city of Memphis for 24 years. Mayors come and go, and every now and then you'll get one who's a real bastard, and we got one of those now. But even the bastards love her. My daughter got her undergraduate degree at Rhodes College, had a straight 4.0, and now she's getting a master's in history at Vanderbilt, planning to go on and do a PhD. She's engaged to another graduate student. She still calls me every day, sometimes twice. Her picture's the background of my cell phone. He started to pull it out and show her, but then realized how insensitive that would be, given what she just said about her daughter. He might have apologized for even bringing his daughter up had he not suspected that such an apology would be unwelcome. I've had my job for 27 years, he continued. In the newspaper business, there's a lot of uncertainty right now. We gave 14 people pink slips just last week but I'll be the last guy fired. Football's king down where I live, and my column's pretty popular. Her only reaction the whole time he was talking was to tap the table once or twice with a carefully polished nail. When he had finished, she said, so what do you have to reveal? That's it. <laughs> That's it? Something besides the wine went to his head. The previous winter, when the Memphis athletic director called a press conference to announce a home and away series with Boston College, he'd gone back to the office and circled the date on his calendar. He'd done it on impulse, and it had stayed there for months as a reminder that on this day, he'd wake up in Boston. He hadn't asked himself why he'd done it. UM played 12 football games a year, and he hadn't circled any other dates nor had he placed a call to Camilla until 10 days ago. At the time, he told himself it was only right and proper to check in on her and see how she was doing. Here, however, there was no getting around his real reason for having called her. He ached to escape from the press box to venture onto the field of play and get trampled. 20 years ago, he said, I heard you making love. I was standing on the porch outside our rental. I'd gone out there to smoke a joint, and I heard you. I should have walked away, but I didn't. I stood there and listened. I listened for the longest time, and I've never forgotten it. You sounded, you sounded absolutely desperate. She speared a piece of duck and a lettuce leaf or two and put them in her mouth. She chewed slowly and with great deliberation, as if the act required every last bit of concentration. 
When she finished, she laid her fork down, lifted her glass, and took another sip. Then she said, I absolutely was, but not like I am now. By the time they left the restaurant, it was after 4 o'clock. The streets were full of traffic, people heading for the expressways, ready to flee the city for the suburbs. The wind had picked up. A northeaster was supposed to hit that night. The globe warned of possible coastal flooding. She hoped she'd securely closed all the windows. She said, my basement will most likely have water standing in it when I wake up. Does that happen a lot? Two or three times a year. You live close to the beach? Seven or eight miles as the crow flies. So where does the water in your basement come from? I live in a hilly area, Melrose Highlands. Every house there takes on water at one time or another. What's your house like? Victorian. Lots of nice touches, I bet. In the restaurant, after he asked her why she felt so desperate now when so much possibility remained for her to enjoy her life, she told him that over the last couple of years, she had had numerous lunches with men she'd found on Match.com or one of the other dating sites, that most of those lunches never led anywhere, or if they did, they led to dinner and before too long a strange bedroom. She'd seen only one guy for any length of time, an economist who taught at Tufts and kept a boat up in Newburyport where he liked to go on weekends. Their last, li their last night together, while they had drinks on deck, both of them bundled up in fleece jackets. He told her that you saw the same people again and again on all the dating sites, that their profiles might go inactive for weeks or even months, but sooner or later they would reappear. He said he didn't know why that was, any more than he knew why both of his marriages had failed. And he made those remarks in the, content, in the context of explaining why he didn't think they ought to see each other again. They weren't looking, he said, for the same things. What are you looking for, Nick had asked. What I had before? Even if it wasn't enough? My notions about what constitutes enough have changed drastically. Staring at his empty plate, he said, I think that maybe mine have too. Now they were strolling in the general direction of his hotel and her subway stop, and he was asking what her house looked like, the house she'd lived in with the man who, he'd said in the restaurant, was in retrospect the closest friend he'd ever had, the one who knew him inside out, even though they hadn't seen each other since they were in their early 30s. My house does indeed have nice touches, she said. There are a couple of turrets, and there's a balcony on the second floor, and out back a nice deck. We had the whole thing repainted not long before Mason died, a pale shade of green that I haven't seen an exact match for anywhere else. At the corner of Berkeley and Boylston, while they waited for the light to change, he took her hand in his. His palm was damp, sweaty. She knew he was scared, and she found his fear contagious. Do you know what I remember about that week we spent together at the beach, she asked. What? The walk signal was eliminated, so they crossed. She said, I recall that one night your wife promised to feed us all. She bought fresh shrimp and boiled them, and then she made capellini and tossed it together with the shrimp and olive oil. She lined six plates up on the counter. And then she spent the next few minutes moving from one plate to another, putting an equal amount of pasta and shrimp on each one. When she finished, about a third of the dish was left, so she divided it into six portions once again and started over, moving down the line from the first plate to the last, trying to make sure that every one of us got exactly the same amount of food. I remember wishing that I could be just that fair to the people in my life, that I could give the same amount of myself to each one so that nobody got less than they deserved. I don't remember that, he said. Well, there's no reason why you should. I don't question it, though. She does it all the time. I complained about it not too long ago on a Friday night when a game I wanted to watch was on ESPN and it was taking her forever to serve the food. I told her if she'd just hurry up, I'd never accuse her of trying to jit me if I got a little less gravy than I deserved or missed out on a few grains of rice. I said I probably wouldn't even notice. She said I might not, but she would. They crossed Copley Square again, raked by the wind, her hair blowing into her face. 
In her leather jacket, she was warm enough, but she knew he must be cold with nothing to protect him but a blazer. Is it always this windy here, he asked. Not always, but often. You ought to see it in winter. I'd like to. Someday I'd sure like to do that. Straight ahead was Back Bay Station and beyond it on Huntington, his hotel. She said, my stop's right up there. Still, he didn't let go of her hand. He kept moving along beside her. Normally, several newspaper vendors would be out in front of the station as well as somebody selling hot dogs, soft drinks, and coffee. But this afternoon, they'd all closed up shop. Even the elderly Russian woman who sold flowers there in all kinds of weather was gone, though she'd been in her usual place when Camilla came in. No one, she guessed, was willing to get caught by the storm. At the station door, she turned, but he continued holding her hand. Mason Carlisle had been the offspring of two CPAs, and from the day Nick met him on the steps of the Kepa Sig house at Ole Miss, He'd proven his ability to make accurate calculations. He chose professors who were likely to give him an A. And he chose girlfriends who were likely to give him a good time at Johnson's Motel or the Ramada Inn. At Ole Miss, the only person he never tried to get anything from was Nick himself. And for the longest time, Nick couldn't understand why. Then one day it hit him. His own father was a small town cotton farmer who rented land from the county and his mother worked as a clerk at the health department. Nick, who hadn't missed a single question on the ACT, was in school on an academic scholarship, and he stocked shelves at a grocery store to earn the money for his fraternity fees. The only thing he could possibly have given Mason was friendship, and as luck would have it, that was all Mason wanted from him and all he ever accepted. Camilla, though, would have been in a different category from the very beginning. And it was impossible not to imagine the calculations his late friend performed in the restaurant on Newberry Street. He would have sensed that she found him appealing. And he would have asked himself whether or not, if he grew tired of her, he could easily extricate himself from whatever situation he'd created. Too much was at stake. He wanted that seat at Fenway, right behind home plate. Back then, he didn't know he might one day crave something as dangerous as love and commitment. If he had, he might have played it safe. Nick, Camilla said, it's been wonderful. Yes, he said, it has. He let go of her hand. As a pair of scruffy kids exited the station, he heard a voice, deep and steady and certain of itself, saying, attention passengers, the next Orange Line train to Oak Grove is now arriving. She rose onto her toes, and he bent and kissed her cheek. Then she opened the door and stepped through it. Thank you.